Hey there, Knicks fans. Give me three. John, give me actually three seconds. Sure. It's all staying in. John, hey there, Knicks fans. We got to get started. Let's go. I'll I'll start the show with you. Hey there, Knicks fans. How you doing? It's your boy, John of the Macri, with you for another episode of the Knicks Film School Podcast. I don't know what's happening right now. Um, I'm joined uh, by by Andrew Claudio, apparently, uh, who wants to be on the stage. I just Hi, didn't. I didn't know Fred was back. I was updating your name because your name's not on the screen. This is for the YouTube audience, not the uh, podcast audience. I'm going back behind the scenes. Enjoy the show, everybody. That's all. Stay we're off. Pod. We're off to just a fantastic start. We're doing about as well as the Pistons are lately, uh, right? They're a real team now, and that's what we're going to talk about for the next. Uh, how, how long do we have today? Fifty-four. Five and, five and thirteen in their last eighteen games. Dude, that's that sounds like a, a mighty. Uh, hey, you know, I, I don't know if the Sixers are five and thirteen in their last eighteen games. It, it, it's close, so uh, you never know what lies around the corner. Um, no, hi Fred, hi Fred Katz of the Athletic and of Cats and Shoot. Um, how are you, my friend? What's going on? <laughs> I'm always wonderful when I'm podcasting with you. Oh, well, that's just. I'm always lie, just. Thank you. Like, it's always just a splendid experience getting to come on here and ruin your podcast. Thrilled to get to do it again. You know, can I just we're, we're gonna get into we're gonna I'm gonna set a timer literally for my nonsense. I'm gonna set a one minute timer. Um because we're not gonna derail the whole show because we don't have a lot of time. Do you know what I learned today existed in the world? Pinworms. I don't. Do you know what pinworms are? No. Yeah. Pinworms are apparently small creatures that live in your butt. And they come out at night and they lay eggs and those eggs itch. And you know why I learned that today? Because your your butt was itchy? It wasn't. My, well, my, I, I'll leave my butt out of this. My daughter's butt has been itchy the last couple of nights and has prevented her from sleeping well. And so I took her to the doctor this morning. And I learned about the existence of pinworms. And my day just went upwards from there. Uh, and Andrew's now back on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no I got nothing. Could. Seems, what, seems what, what, like what, a, what? beyond it all. Seems like a a massive violation of privacy of your daughter that you're sharing this with the world about her. I mean, butt. she's not yet three, so I don't think she has those sorts of rights. So, uh, but no, no, no more <laughs> pinworms, no, no more pistons. Uh, we're we're gonna get right down to <laughs> right down to business. Um, Fred. You are uh, currently covering a basketball team that is in a bit of a weird place. Um, I want to get into a bunch of stuff with what's what's that? Yeah, me too. I said I do. It, it was crazy. Like when your daughter went to the doctor, even the doctor yeah. was like, "Yeah, yeah, pinworms. It's all medical. Day, day, day to day, pinworm soreness." I mean, we've graduated. Could be, from, could be, could be tomorrow. It's all medical. She's, she's getting a little less itchy every day. You imagine that? <laughs> At least OJ Ananobi doesn't have pinworms. Um, so yeah, this team is in a weird place. And like you texted me earlier today, like you always do, like, what are we talking about today? And my initial instinct was to text you back, like, I want to talk about how we're supposed to talk about this team at the moment. Um, because I don't really know that. And I want to get into some specific stuff. Uh, most prominently your your piece that dropped today, which uh predictably was excellent about uh Dante DiVincenzo and his good buddy, Steph Curry. Um, but before we get to there, I just like where, as someone who covers this team every day and has been, you know, has intimate knowledge of them going back several years now, where's your mind at with where the Knicks are at at the moment? I'm just kind of, you know, I, I talked about this a little bit on my podcast that came out today with Dan Devine. And we were both kind of in agreement that it's just kind of like a wait and see sort of situation. And I don't think anything that's happened, they've lost six of their last eight. I don't think anything that's happened during this eight game stretch in which Jalen Brunson has missed games and Isaiah Hartenstein has been, been either out of the lineup or been on a minutes restriction, basically. And Dante DiVincenzo has missed a game and Randall's missed the whole thing. And OG's missed the whole thing. And Mitchell Robinson's missed the whole thing. Boran Bogdanovich missed a game and you go through and it's like every single person, like legitimately the only medical ailment that I have not heard of on the Knicks is pinworms in their butts. That's the only just buttworms is the only yep. thing 
You haven't heard of Miles, it. Doesn't mean it hasn't happened. Miles McBride was questionable with a non-COVID illness. I think That's you right. could put. He ended up playing, but I think you could classify butt pinworms as a non-COVID illness. So I don't. I don't know if we can rule it out. I. It's just hard to evaluate what they are when this isn't. These aren't at all the pieces that we're going to see. These aren't the roles that we're going to see guys in when the team is at its idealized version. That being said, there are smaller nuances out there that are concerning to me. Um, I talked about this on my pod today where it's, it's a little concerning to me that like, I don't think Alec Burks has really made a purposeful pass since getting to the Knicks. That's a little like maybe just like a little little swing late in the shot clock, but I don't think he's made like a purposeful pass since getting to the Knicks. That's a little concerning if if the fully idealized version of this team has him basically being the backup point for 14 minutes. How yep. how exactly is that going to go? Is that going to work in the playoffs with Burks just kind of trying to get his own shot, it not working, and then him swinging to the other side with nine seconds left on the shot clock for a bench player to try to create something or Randall try to create something. Uh, it concerns me that Isaiah Hartenstein just can't seem to to bite this Achilles thing. And every time I talk to him, every time I ask him, he says it's not serious. Every time I ask him, he tells me, you know, the Achilles is not at risk of being popped or anything like that. It's tendinopathy, which is like tendinitis. And it's just him dealing with it and being cautious with it. But the fact that he is continually missing a game or two, coming back, being on a restriction, all of a sudden starting to look pretty good, and then missing a game or two, coming back, being on restriction, finally starting to look good, then missing a game or two, and he again misses Tuesday's game because of the Achilles stuff that he's going through. I just, I'm concerned about that in the long term because. At, at some point, like you have to wonder, is it is it going to affect his actual effectiveness? And, yeah. and we've seen some lesser uncharacteristic games from him of late. He's obviously playing through at the very least discomfort, at the very most pain when he does play. I, I, I'm there. There are certain things where I'm like, that's that's concerning. It doesn't make me think, oh no, this team's in huge trouble. Assuming they're able to get the guys back who they need, but it's. There's some stuff where I'm like, that is stuff that they need to iron out. That's very well put. Um, and I think that's the right approach. And it, it speaks to me, at least, that like, not everything always has to be an existential co- crisis or commentary on the direction of the team. Like, you know, Burks goes one for seven last night. It doesn't, that doesn't automatically need to translate to, why is this front office not prioritizing young players, you know, because they traded Quentin Grimes to get Alec Burks and bogey and like the whole thing. Like it, it, the, we could have like these smaller, more nuanced conversations. Um, and that's kind of where I'm at because I think bigger picture, I'm completely in agreement with you. Um, I want to get back to everything you said in a bit. Um, but I want to, I want to start with the Steven Chenzo article because I think, I don't know if it's an underrated story, but I think one could argue that the most underrated element to New York's accession, ascension to a team that for a little while there, and maybe still, a lot of smart people seem to think like, hey, man, if a couple things break right, this team could be in the finals, is DiVincenzo coming here. And I mean, he's, I don't know. What, what, what can we say? He's third in the league in threes. You know, um, it, you know what's an even more wild stat? I put in my newsletter this morning. Since OG and um, Julius went out, uh, Curry, who we're going to get to also in a second, is first in the league in threes. I think he has 71. DiVincenzo was second with 60-something. The gap between DiVincenzo and Donovan Mitchell, who's in third, is the same as the gap between Donovan Mitchell and I think it's Dame Lillard, who's in like 38th. So like, there's a Curry stratosphere, and then just below it, there's a DiVincenzo stratosphere, and then there's a chasm, and then there's everybody else in the league. Like That's the guy we're talking about here. So before I actually talk about the article, what I always like to ask you is, what was the inspiration for this piece? And how did you come about thinking like, oh, I could I could do this in the way that you ended up doing it? And we, we should also, by the way, shout out um, Anthony Slater, who uh, contributed to the piece as well from Golden State. Golden yeah, State co-authored, State. It. co-authored it. Co-authored it. Co-authored it. Yeah. We wrote it together. Yeah. I, I Yeah. So I was talking... It actually came from, here's a great example for people who wonder, like, why do reporters need to be in the locker room? Mm -hmm. This story is actually a great example as to why it's beneficial for reporters and for 
And for Andrew's going to kill me, I just readjusted my camera in the middle of a podcast. That's got to just kill him. It's we have to start the pot over. Exactly. Uh, it's 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 very beneficial to be in there. And here's a great example of why, because the best story ideas come from random conversation that you're having with someone about a thing you didn't know. And you saying, oh, that's so interesting. Can I write it? Because generally, if it's a thing that you already know and a thing you already know to ask about, generally, it's a little bit less interesting because it's something you can figure out without access to people. You know, if it's my job to find out stuff that other people are unable to because they don't have access to players like I do or to coaches like I do or to front office people like I do. It's my job to find that kind of stuff out. And what happened was a few weeks ago or a couple of weeks ago, I I had a story published about Dante's ascension as a three-point shooter and what happened there. And I knew I wanted to write something that ran over the all-star break about how crazy this three-point jump has been for him how wild the improvement has been for him and how defenses are guarding him totally differently than they ever have picking him up at half court at times, double teaming him. He's like on a scouting report. He's on the scouting report, sometimes near the top, depending on the team. Like he is unbelievably important uh, when you have to game plan for the Knicks because his shooting is just vital and he'll kill you. Like his last 27 games he's had, he's made more than five threes in 10 of those 27 games. Insanity. He's he's just meanwhile Curry is averaging like five threes made on the season. Just a whole, just a whole it, other. <laughs> it does put into perspective, like it, as if we needed more perspective. Like it it sh- it puts into perspective, like Curry really is playing a ca- kind of a different sport than everybody else. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's a quote in the story that, that we're talking about right now from Dante, where he's like, "I just want to make it clear, like I'm not aspiring to be Steph Curry." No one is Steph Curry. And then he just starts repeating like what he's doing now. It's ridiculous. And then he just starts repeating. It's ridiculous. It's just, it's just so ridiculous. And he's, he's saying it the way that, you know, some NBA fan in a bar would say it to me, you know, he's being like, it's ridiculous. It's just so ridiculous what he's doing. I mean, that's like the tone. He's just baffled, blown away by what Curry is doing. He's like, so I I don't, strive to get to Steph's level. No one is going to get to Steph's level. You're just not going to. And, and uh, the way it happened with Dante was I was, I was doing that story and I had just done the interview with him for that story where he was super accommodating and helpful. And I finished the interview and Dante is a huge hoops head. And anyone who listens to this podcast and has heard me on it before knows that I am the biggest nerd when it comes to the NBA. So he and I just kind of started talking talking basketball and somehow we got around to, we got around to something with the warriors and he mentioned something about Steph's shooting form and how I think Curry had maybe had a big game that night before. And he mentioned something about Steph's shooting form. And he mentioned something about how Steph's shooting form, like he, he cares so much about his shoulders being angled to the basket the right way and how it's so important. He was like, that was like one of the things that I, took away from playing for him. Like I re I redid my shooting for him over the summer after seeing how he squares his shoulders. I was like, dude, I'm going to cut you off. Can I turn my recorder on right now? <laughs> like that's, <laughs> that's so interesting. Can that's I turn great. my recorder on right now? And he was like, he's like, yeah, sure. And, and so I turned the recorder on and we had this really interesting conversation about, about shooting fundamentals and, and all that. Honestly, the whole conversation from him was, was great. There were quotes I didn't include in the story, but I thought were really interesting just about the art of shooting. Uh, and, and I had that. And once I had that, I was like, you know, he had told me just how much he genuinely liked Steph and how those two really, you know, really came to just get along incredibly well when he was there in golden state and how great of a teammate Steph was. And I, so I hit up Anthony Slater who covers the the Warriors for us. Now I was like, dude, I got a story. I feel like we should do it. And I, I told him to, I was like, can you get Steph? He was like, absolutely. So he got Steph and Steph was awesome. And, and quite honestly, my favorite part of the story is just hearing Steph talk so technically about jump shooting. Like to me, I, when, when Slater did the interview, he was like, I got Steph. I was like, how was he? He said he was good. And Slater sent me the interview. I was like, dude, this is awesome. 
<laughs> like <laughs> these, these are quotes are so good. Like he, he's talking so specifically and so technically about jump shooting, just the yeah. greatest shooter who ever lived. It's not even close. Nobody would ever disagree with you. Reggie Miller doesn't disagree with you that no. he's the greatest jump shooter ever. It, begrudgingly, he agrees. I don't even think he begrudgingly I, agrees. I, I think he says it through gritted teeth, but he, he says it. I don't know. He says it. He offers it he up a it. lot. He offers he it does. up a it lot. Does. He knows it's he has all. to. That's why. Because it's so it's, it's so obvious. It's so obvious. Exactly. Yeah. It's so obvious that even Reggie Miller has to be like, yeah, yeah it's true. Uh, even though I actually disagree. I think he says it enthusiastically. The one thing That's Reggie fair. Miller takes a lot of crap. The one thing I will say about Reggie Miller as a broadcaster is that at least he loves the game. At least oh, he's yeah. not one of those old heads who's not like just crapping on every single player, no matter what. Like at least Reggie Miller loves the game and appreciates the modern day player at least and, and praises the modern day player. And with Steph, I just thought it was so cool to hear him talk about the best way to generate power in a jump shooter. Like if you, if you play, if you're someone who plays pickup, if you're someone who played in high school or middle school, or you currently play in school or on a travel team or whatever, like you should read those quotes from Steph. They're, they're really interesting. And it's just, it just gives you a really interesting perspective on, on jump shooting. Yeah, I mean, he he makes a comp. I was just searching for it. I just found it. Uh, like shoot, and I would have never in a million years thought of this, but like comparing shooting a jump shot to shooting a bow and arrow, or like throwing a dart, um, and how like the way you lead in doing those things are similar. And he's talking about like how his feet are pointed and the whole thing, and it's just it's wild. Um, I agree with you that that's probably the coolest part of the story. The most interesting part of the story for me, as will surprise nobody who's ever listened to me before, because I am fascinated by team building stuff, is the opening part from Steph about how Dante talked to him over the summer when he was considering his free agency options. And I'm just going to tee it up for you again. Can you perhaps share a little bit about that part of the story? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so so Dante. We owe first, Steph one. in short. <laughs> yes, for sure. Hey, couldn't couldn't get Steph in 2009, but. <laughs> Steph got the Knicks Dante in 2023. Uh, he, so yeah, Dante signed with the Warriors in 2022 and he did it for a discount. And Steph and Draymond were two really big guys recruiting him there. Really, the lead guy, Dante, Dante told me the, the really the most important recruiter getting him there was Draymond. He had met Draymond at the ESPYs and he got to know him a little bit. And Draymond really wanted him to come. And, and Draymond's selling point and Steph's selling point was there's not a huge market for you right now, but there should be a mm -hmm. huge market for you. Mm -hmm. You're coming off a not great year. Just come to Golden State, sign a one-year deal, sign it for cheap, less than what you can get because we can't pay you more than that because of the cap rules and all that. Sign it for less, but you'll come here. Everyone's going to worry about Clay and everyone's going to worry about Steph and we're coming off a championship and Draymond's going to be able to find you and all that kind of stuff. Come to Golden State. You're going to get tons of open shots and you're going to hit those open shots. And next year, you're going to go into free agency and you're going to be coming off a really good season on really strong numbers. And Dante was like, you're right. And he went there and he loved being there. He didn't. He didn't want to leave. The problem was because of the NBA's, you know, salary cap, he could yeah. get they had non bird rights on him and they they couldn't offer him anywhere close to a competitive offer to keep him because they were over the salary cap and they weren't able to keep him. And so everything that they said was going to happen happens. Dante shoots 40% from three during that one year in Golden State and struggled in the playoffs, but had a really strong year. And then he hits free agency and he's considering a number of options. Uh, to my knowledge, the two teams that were the most in contention for him were, were obviously the Knicks, because that's where he went, and Minnesota. And he says there were other teams to decline to reveal who the teams were. Uh, he didn't want to talk about other teams. Uh, we were able to get from league sources that Minnesota was, was one of them, uh, yeah. and, and certainly one that was in real contention for him. And he calls up Steph, and he says what do you think I should do? Like, he just thought Steph, Steph was right about his career the summer before Draymond was right about his career the summer before. And he and Steph had 
grown to have this this really this 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 really nice relationship where like I don't think they're best friends or anything like that, but there's this incredible mutual respect between the two of them. Mm-hmm. They both just really like each other. You can tell. Cool. And they had this great working relationship together. And Dante has this just unbelievable respect for Steph. I mean, you can mm-hmm. tell from the way that he talks about him. He talks about him with this incredible amount of almost reverence. And he he makes it clear, like he says he went into that season in Golden State. Like he didn't want to be the guy who was just trying to cozy up next to the future Hall of Famer. Like he didn't want to be the guy who was being like, oh, you're so great. You're so awesome. So he didn't even really want to talk about basketball with him. So he just kind of was like, I'm going to approach him as a person. He's just a person. And I'm just going to approach him as a person. And do you think that's why his and Steph's relationship got to where it was? Because he was like, we didn't talk about basketball in the beginning. We were just like, we're going to talk as people. We're going to talk about life. We're going to talk about normal things. And we're just going to not talk about basketball. We're not going to talk about how this dude's the greatest shooter who ever stepped on the planet. We're, we're just going to talk about life and leave it at that. And then all of a sudden, they started talking basketball. And Dante started learning all this stuff from Steph. And that's where these, these fundamentals start, start to change, not just the shoulders, but also the way that he leans on his pull-up shots. He, he used to lean a little bit back on his pull-up shots. Now he wants to lean forward, just out, which is what Steph does. And that's something that he, he kind of copied from Steph. And so he calls Steph in free agency this summer, and, and he was leaning towards the Knicks when he called. Yeah. But he wanted to get Steph's opinion because he just respects him a lot. And Steph told him he thought the Knicks were the way to go. Uh, Steph said he liked the fit. They had a good year the year before. Uh, he thought it would make a lot of sense with them playing with Josh Hart and Jalen Brunson and his college buddies. It, he thought it made a lot of sense. And again, Steph definitely correct. It's worked out very well for all parties involved. The Warriors got a really good year out of Dante DiVincenzo. Dante got way better and then got, to, got a payday. And then got to a situation which is great for him, and he's been great for them. So, a a a story of a, like a win 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 NBA story. It's wild because, like, especially, I mean, most free agency I feel like that gets done where teams where a player will switch teams in free agency. Like, how many free agent contracts are there handed out each summer involved with a with someone signing for above the what um what Dante got almost all of the the non taxpayer mid level like I don't know was there like half a dozen each summer with in terms of switching teams uh, less than ten I would feel like on an a- on average like you're not you're not getting free agency is not the way it used to be you're not you're not getting the, these guys that are switching teams like this anymore and so like we've spent a lot of time talking yeah. about how teams, ra- teams will also split up the mid level yeah. more now too. Absolutely. Where, like they'll save it for second round picks or undrafted free agents or buyout guys or whatever else. So like we we've talked about how kind of crazy it is that the Knicks have used free agency to get their two best players, two guys who are, you know, both all stars and like Brunson will make an all NBA team this year. Randall already has made all NBA teams. Um, but like we could I mean, he's not on the level of those players. I don't think, you know, he's probably never gonna make an all star team, but DiVincenzo, I don't know, man. I don't know what like the the quote unquote like co- core piece. What does a core piece even mean? I, I, whatever it is, I kind of feel like Dante Divincenzo has become a core piece for this team. Like if the no, I guess I'll put it this way: the notion of like they're uh, talking star trades this summer and his name comes up. Like I would think they will think very long and hard before they just throw his his name in, you know, into any deal. Right? Is that fair to say? Yeah, definitely. I mean, for sure, you have to. It's it's not just how good he's been. It's also the fact that the Knicks are paying him $47 million over four years. That is not a lot of money in today's NBA climate. That That's not a lot of money for a starter, let alone a good starter. Mm. who is third in the league and made threes and is a legitimately good defender, a really good off-ball defender, 
a very solid on ball defender, a team player who moves smart, great shooter. Like those kind of guard guys are like, he's, he's three and D and then some, right? Yep. Because he's not just three and D and you get a, a legitimately good three and D starter. That's we're, we're, we're talking at least in the high teens. I was about to say, I mean, I feel like is at it 20 kind of the, the, yeah. the it's around 20 is where you're starting at. Yeah. Um, I mean, look at like, look at like what someone like Cam Johnson got. It's not a perfect comp. They're not the same player, but Cam Johnson was also restricted with a bog yeah. down market because of restricted free agency yeah. and, and is not really the defender that DiVincenzo is. And he's taller and he's a forward and all of that. I get it. I'm just, he's the first person who came to mind. Like, well, look at Herb Jones. Somebody, the, the Herb Jones hadn't the shot hadn't really come around when he extended for that. Yeah, number. and he he would have gotten more too. He would have gotten oh, more. He was absolutely. he was capped out by he yes. got he got his max he got yes. his max extension, not a max, yes. but they were only able to pay him like fifty six over four years because he was an arenas provision guy. Yeah. So he would have gotten more, but he's also like arguably the best perimeter defender in the NBA. Yes, absolutely. Again, I don't know that they're. I guess the let's put it this way. The fact that there aren't a whole lot of true three and D plus guys out there, it makes it finding a comp kind of tough. Um, so to back to your original point, like to get a guy like this on this contract. And, so, and again, I think it's it's probably noise, but I was looking at the on off numbers today since OG and Julius went down. And you know who's the defensive on off is the biggest discrepancy is actually Dante. Like they're a lot better defensively when he's on, and um, kind of fall off a cliff when he's when he's not on. Again, I th- it's thirteen games. It's you know, and, and God knows he's playing like forty minutes a night, so there's not a whole lot of sample size with him off the court. But he's just been really good on on that end of the floor as well. So, good for yeah, him. he's been he's been really good. I would have to look into the on offs over that sort of over that sort of sample. I'd have to look into the on offs to see exactly why. Yeah, I don't. Well, that's a that's a good transition. Um, to for what, what for what it's what, worth, by the way. Yep. For what it's worth, a couple guys who called up a list as a cheat. Just just a couple guys. Okay. Dylan Brooks is making twenty three million dollars this year. That's good. Dylan Brooks is making twenty three million dollars this year. He was a free agent last summer. Got about twice as much. He got what ninety ninety two right over four years. 86 something. You got 86, okay. 86, maybe whatever it was. Right. Dylan Brooks, maybe 90, something like that. Whatever it was, it was approximately twice as much as Dante DiVincenzo. Similar sort of mold of guy. Dylan Brooks is, is more of an on ball defender. He's a really good on ball defender. A, he consistently guards the other team's best player and is competitive as all hell. Like every single time for better uh, or worse. Keldon Johnson got makes 20. And for what it's worth, Devin Chenzo is 26 years old. Buddy Healed makes 20. Yeah. Evan Fournier makes 19. And, and, the reason why that's, <laughs> and the reason why Evan Fournier's salary is relevant is because that's the Knicks signed him to yeah. jack up a bunch of threes. The, the record that Devin Chenzo is pacing to break is Evan Fournier's franchise record for, for threes made in the season. Bogdan Bogdanovich. Makes 18.7. Oh, yeah. Like Gary Trent makes 19. It's like none of these are perfect comps by any stretch. Derek White makes 18 and is and is vastly outperforming that this year. Uh, but you look at these comps. Norman Powell makes 18. Like, like none of these guys are, are perfect comps. They're not the exact player. But these are guys who are, are solid enough and have enough overlap with Dante that you're like, okay, should that guy be making... 60% more twice mm. as much as Dante DiVincenzo. And I think the answer is definitely not. I mean, that is an unbelievably team friendly contract right there. That's a, it's worked into a hell of a deal. And you look at the other guys who are like instant offense and are better, but like you can go there are guys on the other side of that fence where it's like, you're like, Oh, we got this guy who is either a really good bench player or a fine enough starter, and we got to hold on to him because he's in his twenties. Let's just give Jordan Poole all the money. 
you know? I mean, we could even go back to the whole Tyler Hero discussion during last season's playoffs, where it's like, what are the Heat really losing without this guy? Because he takes something off the table on defense. And like, how much do you really need his his creation? Um, you know, and, and whatever, we're, we're not to get into all that. But like, yeah, you don't. And I guess, I, I, so again, to kind of transition, you don't need to worry despite the fact that as we talked about all season, like Thibodeau doesn't want to play more than two guards at once. You don't really need to worry about DiVincenzo being on the floor defensively. At the very least, you don't need to worry. And I think there's an argument that he's a real asset when he's like, again, not guarding the other team's best player. Um, And I'm kind of working backwards here because I'm already like thinking ahead to when the guys get back healthy, because I don't know when's the next time we're going to talk. We're going to talk before that. But like, I'm thinking about these new guys that they got in the trade. I haven't really talked about this yet because it, I guess it just hasn't come up. But like with Steven Chenzo playing as well as he is, I kind of view him as someone who will get more minutes than he was getting after the OG trade, but before Julius and OG went down. He was I just checked it today. He was averaging 24 minutes a game for that. It's a 14 game stretch. Now obviously since then he's averaged 38 minutes a game. He's not going to get that. But like with everything he's doing, what he, what he's showing you that he's famous last doing, words. I my favorite follow-up question of the season. Yeah. Was before whatever game it was. The whole season blacks out to me once I live past it. There was a road game recently. I don't know. Must have been Philly. Okay. It was it was the Philly, the Philly game after the All-Star break. And Tibbs in the pregame says that Isaiah Hartenstein is not on a minutes restriction, but he's on a guideline. And we're all we're all joking that like the training staff must have just been told so many times that Tibbs doesn't care about minutes restrictions that they had to rebrand minutes restrictions and be like, you know, Tom, gr- great news. Isaiah is not on a minutes restriction. And Tom's like, amazing. What's the bad news? And they're like, well, he does have some guidelines. And Tibbs is like, oh, guidelines I can work with. What are the guidelines? They're like, he can't play over this many minutes consecutively. Uh, and they're like, and they're like, oh, okay. That's just a guideline though, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's just a guideline. And so we didn't really know what guidelines were. So Isaiah was sitting there in the locker room. We went and we chatted with Isaiah and we turned on our recorders and, and Isaiah's talking and, and we asked him like, what are guidelines? And he, and he was like, yeah, you know, I just can't play a certain number of minutes in, in consecutively, but you know, I, I, I can, I can play like I, it's not an overall minutes yeah. restriction. And, but I also know I'm not going to play 40 minutes tonight. And and then Steve Popper's follow up question was, I wouldn't be so sure about that. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so we shouldn't be so sure about the number of minutes that Dante is going to play. But I think it's going to be I think it's going to be a lot of minutes moving forward, regardless of who is healthy, um, because he's just become indispensable. And we know what Brunson is going to play, obviously. Randall, if he's back, and I'm assuming if he's back, he's going to be a full go. I don't think they're going to put him back out there unless he's unless he's himself. Uh, unless you, you disagree with that or you feel feel that's fair to say. I don't you know. Don't, okay. I mean, he went back out there during the playoffs last year when he wasn't himself. So I don't that's true. That's I fair. don't know. I think knowing Julius, he's going to push really, really hard to play, no matter what. And I can say that with a lot of confidence because I know that's what he's doing behind the scenes right now. Okay. Uh, he 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 really wants to play. He really wants to come back. He really wants to get to a point where he can get cleared and play. And I think he is just the type of dude who wants to play. And we all know this. He just he wants to play through pain. He doesn't want to sit. And I could envision a world where he comes back, and and it all comes from. At some point, I'm going to write something about this because it's it's interesting because it, it all comes from a good place. It comes from a place sure. of like, he wants to be tough. He wants to contribute. He wants to be there for his team. He wants to help. He hates sitting out. Like he, he, he wants to do all these. These are all good traits to have in a player and a teammate. He cares. That's yeah. good. And, and every single coach would take a guy who you have to tell to chill out over a guy who you have to ramp up, especially this one. But every other coach would agree. 
And and in that sense, Randall is a guy who you, who you have to tell to chill out and you kind of have to save him from himself. But I could see a world where he's like, no, I'm good. I'm good. I don't feel anything. I'm good. And he's just, you know, toughing out pain mm. in his right shoulder and it affects his play. I could see it just because that's what happened in the playoffs last year where he's saying, I'm good. He wasn't complaining behind the scenes. I've asked so many people behind the scenes. Were there any hints that Julius's injury was like as serious as it seemed when he was playing beyond his caliber of play? Like, was he, did he complain about it? Was he limping? Was he, was he, was he just even in the smallest way? Was he just being like, like, did he have to do more stuff to get ramped up? And, and everyone's like, nah, nah, he was just, you knew it was a serious injury because that's a serious injury, what he had. And he eventually needed surgery on it, but you didn't realize the amount of pain that he was in. And now you look back on that playoff run a little differently, knowing how much pain he was in, but he shot 35% in the playoffs or whatever it was, 30 some odd percent. And 20 something percent from deep. Um, And the defense and the defense was disastrous in a lot of moments. The transition defense was not there. The energy plays were not there and it was because he was in so much pain, but I'm not, I'm not even saying it as a criticism because he's playing really hurt. So obviously he's going to play worse, but it's like, I can't rule out that that definitely won't happen again because it happened just last year. Yeah. I all, I completely agree with all of that. And he is a crazy person and he's going to do whatever it takes to get on the court, even if it means lying, um, presumably about how he feels. I, but if he's, if he's back and he's playing, I think he's going to play a lot. Um, I can't. So like, I can't imagine a world where Julius Randall comes back and he's playing under 30 minutes a night. Um, Yeah. Me neither. neither. Yeah. Like I just, that's, that just doesn't compute. Um, OG. There's, there's, yeah. there's a world where he plays 48. Oh, absolutely. I mean, look, you, <laughs> but not, no, but not I, 25. no, I don't. Yeah. I don't think that's crazy at all. Uh, OG seems like he's, you know, they're going to, he's going to be hundred percent or close to hundred percent when he comes back, you know, obviously we know what Tibbs, how many minutes Tibbs was playing him. And like, I'll even throw in like, if either of those guys is limited a little bit in whatever they can do, or if they feel they can't play him as many minutes, we got precious now sitting there. Um, which then gets into the discussion about Mitch coming back. I'm, I'm, I don't want to go too far on the big men because I guess what I'm more focused on is like with Dante playing like this with Brunson, he's going to play a ton of minutes and we know Tibbs loves him some Josh Hart. Like there's no world where Josh Hart is going to play under, you know, half of every game. And I'm, I think that's a low estimate, but so, you know, 24 or whereabouts or more like, it's interesting because I, I, there's a very long-winded way of getting to this point, which is that they made this trade with Detroit that has a lot of... Some people peeved at the moment because of how the guys have looked, although I think Bogdanovich has looked pretty good and will look better when some of the other guys get back. And the 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 trade ostensibly was made to serve two masters, to bridge the gap until the guys come back and then to help them when they get to the playoffs make a potentially deep run. I'm starting to think about it. I'm like, well, A... How many minutes are these guys really playing if everybody's healthy and back for the playoffs? And in the short term, are how much are they helping? Now, Bogdanovich, I think, has helped. Um, he hasn't been perfect. He has been quite imperfect on the defensive end, but I think he has helped. Alec Burks has looked... I, do you have a word for how Alec Burks has looked? Is is He's not looked good. Let's just, let's just say that. My, my mama told me, if you don't have anything nice to say, he, he no, looks it's like always been a few, it's only been a few games, but he has not played yeah. his best basketball. He has not played his best. He looks like he's playing with with pinworms. Uh, <laughs> it's, they're very uncomfortable, Fred. I can tell. They I can must be. They they are. My my. I've seen my daughter writhing around in pain the last two nights. Not not fun. Um, no, I th- he'll be better. Uh, I I listen. You sound like me. I've been telling everybody who's willing to listen to me still about this that he will be better. Bogey will be better. Bogey will look better. But it, it does create this interesting. I'm a kind little of, concerned about Burks. You're a little concerned. I'm I'm concerned about him from this perspective. Like, let's say they just get OG back right in in three weeks, and let's say Burks has ca- kind of continued to meander along in 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 the next two to three weeks. Well, for one, 
if he continues to meander along, even if he starts playing a little bit better, but it's not great. I wonder how the Knicks are going to fare in the next two to three weeks. But then once OG's back, it like I'm assuming Tibbs is going to go right out and start playing him big minutes. Like already, even without Julius, I think you're going to start to see a bit of a minutes crunch. Like how long of a rope is Burks going to get here? And then I guess my my longer term, bigger picture question is if we get to the playoffs and all these guys are back, like I wonder how much these Detroit guys are going to play. Uh, that's just something that's been on my mind recently. So I'll just let, what, what, do you have any thoughts on any of that? Yeah. I mean, I think the intention with the trade is that Burks is going to be kind of the backup one in the playoffs. And maybe that's only 12 minutes, but here's why I say I'm a little concerned about Burks. It's not the shooting percentages, you know, eventually he'll hit 40% of his threes and eventually he'll hit 39% of his layups instead of 30, you know, like yeah. that's just, that's just what the Alec Burks experience is going to be. And it's been six games or whatever it's been like, he'll, 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 he'll hit the threes, not concerned about him hitting his threes. What I'm concerned about is what I said at the start of the podcast. Yeah. Not, not the pinworms, not the, the, that he hasn't made a purposeful pass. And when I say purposeful pass, I'm talking like there is a play in last night's game against the Pelicans when Burks ISOs up on the left wing with 17 seconds left on the shot clock. And he goes through the legs and he tries a little step back and it doesn't work. And then he just picks it up and there's 10 seconds left on the clock. And he just swings it to the other side to Don from Dave DiVincenzo, who has to run an emergency pick and roll, which falls flat, and the Knicks don't score. Mm -hmm. That is not what the Knicks should have acquired him for. No. And I understand that last night's Knicks were incredibly shorthanded. And maybe Alec Burks feels like he, he has the need to create more stuff because there's no Jalen Brunson, and there's no Julius Randle, and there's no OG Ananobi, and there's no Isaiah Hartenstein. You know, like maybe he he feels the need to pick up more slack and 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 that may very well be the case. But if that's how Burks is going to play with the second unit in 12 backup point guard minutes during the playoffs to eight, 10 backup point guard minutes during the playoffs. I, I think there's an argument that you'd rather just have Miles McBride out there because at least Miles McBride is probably even though Miles McBride will dribble, 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 dribble. Yeah. But when he but at least you can space him to the opposite corner and get Randall on the post and you can deal with that. Like he his intentions are good. It's just that he's not at the 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 point of of the game mentally where he's he's reading it so quickly on offense right now. And I think his intentions aren't to dribble all the time. But with Burks, it's like there's a whole lot of dribbling that leads to his own shot. And I'm just concerned about those moments when he's supposed to be setting up the offense and the bench unit. He, he sets up offenses late, like consistently when he, when, when he is the guy who is supposed to be setting up the offense consistently, it's like 14 left on the shot clock. And I'm, I'm when they get into their offense and I'm just like, I'm concerned mildly about that kind of stuff, not getting better. Maybe he gets more comfortable and it starts to look better but Burks is not exactly like, you know, a distributor uh, type. I, well, I'll go uh, a I, step further. Like, sorry, I cut you off. What were you going to say? No, I was just going to say, like, this is the most extreme version of who he is in terms of playing this style. Yes. But it is, he is this style. Yeah. And so I, I'm, I just, I guess I should, I should rephrase and just say, like, I'm more anxious to see, like, Randall's back staggering so he can play with that second unit what's burks doing is he is he in that weak side corner in the bench unit is he just like an outlet at the on the wing ready to you know catch and shoot if randall gets doubled in the post if that's the case awesome he's gonna hit those shots he's gonna be really good in those roles and i actually do think he's defended pretty well since yeah, coming to the next defense he's been he's been totally solid he's had some really good plays navigating screens off the ball like he's been totally solid and he's got length and he knows how to use it and he's and he's been pretty good on that front but like i don't know i just 
if stylistically this is how he's going to play, I could see a world and I could see matchups where Deuce McBride is a more helpful guy out there for you. I mean, what I was going to say is take it a step further. Like if, you know, it's not crazy to think that Tibbs is going to go to eight men in a playoff game. How about neither of them? Um, there's that possibility exists. I think I could see and just, I don't know if it's Dante running the backup units nominally as the, as the quote unquote backup point guard. If it, Josh Hart, like, I, I don't know. Um, but I, I just wonder, you know, again, it's, 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 it's concerning feels like too strong of a word, but it, it's gotten off to such a bumpy start that you, you know, you have to wonder when there's going to be a recalibration as to what the, what the long-term thinking is. And then, you know, in the short term, um, I don't know about you, Fred, but I, I think these next. Well, let me ask you this: Do you think OG is going to be back for the West Coast trip? If you had to guess, and with the caveat that you are guessing, you are a Knicks beat reporter who's guessing. I'm guessing. You're guessing, not reporting it. Guessing. So Thursday, tomorrow, is the three week anniversary. What? Why was everyone so up in arms about Tib saying? pregame yesterday that OG hasn't shot a basketball yet. I, I have no earthly clue. Why was everyone so we knew this? I don't know. He's not supposed to be shooting a basketball yet. You're, you're asking the wrong guy because I, I heard that and I was like, okay. Yeah. And then I see everybody. So, oh my goodness, this is terrible. Wait, no, it's fine. It's totally fine. He's not supposed to be shooting a basketball yet. Nick said on February 8th, three weeks until he's reevaluated. That means three weeks of him doing the same crap and not shooting basketballs and not playing basketball in any fashion and reevaluated sometime on or around February 29th. So the reevaluation is going to come at some point in the next few days. From everything that I hear, he's hitting the markers. It's a, it's a routine surgery. It's a routine arthroscopic cleanup to remove loose bone fragments. Like it's a, it's a very routine sort of surgery that doctors have done a million times. And from everything that I hear, everything is going fine. The expectation has always been that not too long after the reevaluation, I think we talked about it last time I was on the pod, right? When I kept saying not too long, not too yeah. long, no, you not said too long. That. Yeah. Like not too long after the reevaluation, he's going to be clear for on court stuff. And presumably he should still be in shape because he hasn't been out for that long and he's got an elbow injury, which, uh, which doesn't prevent him from yeah. doing cardio or anything like that. So he, he should presumably be in shape and the ramp up shouldn't be as ex- intense as it'll be for someone like Mitchell Robinson, who's been recovering from ankle surgery and wasn't able to run and jump and all that for a really long time. Uh, so, so I, I, I think it's definitely possible. <laughs> I think it's definitely possible that he is back in time for the West coast road trip, but I don't know. I don't know for sure. We have to see how that reevaluation goes. And then if it goes as expected, then I think it's possible he's back by mid March. That's, that's, that's in the cards, but it's just, you can't, can't guess right now. I don't have all the information. And I should say for anybody who may be listening and hasn't memorized the next schedule. Um, the West Coast trip starts uh, two weeks from the day that this podcast is dropping uh, in in Portland, uh, which is followed by games in Sacramento, Golden State, and Denver. So, gets progressively more more daunting as as you go along. There, I guess I'm uh, we're at the point where I'm starting to think of the rest of the season in in segments, and it's like you got the next six games. Then you got the four game West Coast trip and then you come back and it's uh, then you actually have a reprieve. You have four games in a row that you should win Brooklyn, Detroit at Toronto at San Antonio. And then all of a sudden it's the last 10 games um, or, or nine games, wherever it is with some some challenging opponents in there. But like I'm I'm now looking at these next six and I I kind of think these next six games are really important. Um and I am saying that as someone who I am about ready to punt on any thoughts of the two or three seed, maybe not punt, but like at this point, I'd be mildly surprised. Um, and it, I, it would take one of those teams to just like start coming back to the pack. And it, that certainly doesn't seem like it, not with Max Struess hitting, you know, 65 footers to win games. Uh, we don't have to talk Max Struess, by the way, 
signed four for 64 the same <laughs> summer. Dante DiVincenzo signed four for 47. Well, listen, he's hitting, he's again, he's hitting 60 footer. So he's, oh, he's, he's been in that contract. He's been much better for them than his percentages show. He's, he, he's not shooting an incredible percentage from three, but he's been, he's been good for them. They're using him in a ton of ball screening actions. And he's, he's been, he's, he's been really important with, especially when all the injured guys were out. Like he's, yeah. he's a good player. He's been good for them. He's been he's good for them defensively. He's he's been what they wanted, uh, what they what they paid for. Um, but like I, I think these next bunch of games are important. And I think like, you know, Bogey's been okay. Burks has not been good. Um, they like, I don't know if like they don't need to go like three and three, they need to go two and four. Like if they ever went one and five in these next six games, um, all of which are against teams that like will show up and like give a commensurate effort. Um you know, all of a sudden, it's like you're looking down there. Who's in eighth right now at the at press time? I think Indiana actually, at two games back, two and a half games back, whatever they are. Like, screw around here, and all of a sudden, again, you go into that West Coast trip. Not that it's not a picnic, and then like you, you, you want to stay in decent position for that stretch run where you, where, where you're coming home and and you you feel like you can solidify whatever your position is. Last thing and then I got to let you go uh, cuz I have to go as well. Um I've had some people ask me ask me about like have the goalposts changed this season and if so like which direction have they changed it? Do you think like at this point with all the injuries and I've asked you a version of this question before. So and again we don't need to talk about it a long time cuz again we have to leave. Um do you think the like the front office cares, like the organization cares about that sort of thing, or they're just kind of like, look, we'll get the guys back when we get them back, and we'll do however we're going to do? About which sort of thing? The, like in terms of goals for the season, like what counts as a successful season? What the Knicks internally at this point, with this rash of injuries, with how the East is very good, like all of that sort of stuff? Do you think they are still like have a bullseye on we we must make it this far we must accomplish x yes, y and z i don't i don't think they're going to be happy if they lose in the first round of the playoffs there you go that was the answer to my question <laughs> i don't think i i just do not think this team is going to be happy if they lose in the first round of the playoffs I, I i don't even even if they end up getting the four seed and they play philly in the first round and Joel Embiid comes Embiid. back for the first round series and Embiid has an epic MVP level series and the Sixers win in a hard fought epic first round series that goes seven games. And it's like that Clippers Spurs series from 2014, where <laughs> it just captures series. the whole country. And Great even series. though it's the first round and even if it's that, I don't think they'll be happy losing in the first round. The goal of this team is to make a real run. They made it to the second last year. They, they know that at full strength, they're a better team than they were last year. They made these moves to be better than they were last year. Uh, I, I think, you know, you look at the Grimes trade. That was about this year. It was. You know, it was. It had an eye on the future to a degree. Bogdanovich's salary is going to be helpful in a star trade, all that kind of stuff. But like, that was about this year. You traded a 23-year-old for two vets. Yep. That's about the now. And I'm not saying that if that scenario with Philly occurs, then all of a sudden get rid of everybody. That's not what yeah. I'm saying. I just, I think they will be disappointed if they lose in the first round. Now, if they have an insanely hard fought second round series against say Milwaukee and Milwaukee edges it out, I could see them being like, Hey, we, and then Milwaukee wins the title, like or Boston and Boston wins the title. I could see them being like, Hey, we had a great season. We're right there. Okay. Uh, but, but, I think it is context dependent to a degree. I just struggle to see, like, especially if the injuries drop them to the play in or something. And now all of a sudden you yeah. have a really tough first round matchup and you lose because you dropped to seventh or something you, like that, that. Well, that to me would be the disaster. Uh, yeah. Like you, you got to stay out of the plane. Um, yeah. One, one way or another after, after you made this trade. Um, okay. You have to go. I have to go. Fred Katz, uh, find him at the athletic uh read him at the athletic subscribe to the athletic subscribe to cats and shoot on uh patreon um did i miss anything you missed nothing uh ask your doctor about pinworms or or the or the medical term for it i can't believe oxyuriasis isn't it great that it has ass in the name oxyuriasis and at that, on that note, I've got pinworms in my oxyuriasis. 
<laughs> Thank you for listening to another episode of the Knicks Film School podcast where you could learn about oxyariasis and more. Um, Thank you, Fred Katz, for giving us more of his time and insight on oxyuriasis and some basketball. And uh, we will speak to you again uh, very soon. Peace out.